But if he's like playing nicely in the corner and he's being good, like I'm probably going to just let him be, right? He's just being good. So I'm going to let him do his thing. Zoe, on the other hand, same thing. She starts to get attention when she bumps her head or when something negative happens, right? So when you're a parent, you get into this mode where I'm going to give you attention when something negative is happening, right? So I know if you've got a teenager, maybe you understand this for sure. Teenagers are kind of like these little lurking monsters that stay in their room a lot. And then they come out when they want to unleash something on you. And so putting the forefront of negative attention once again. So I know with my own teenager, um, it's so important, especially when they're at that age to find their strengths, help them find their strengths. And if you're not helping them find your, find their strengths, they're going to have a little bit of a confusing start into adulthood. Now, I haven't completely raised a child yet. I'm two years away from being able to say that. I've got a 16 year old. And he asked me as we had this conversation and even our own house, he asked me, mom, what are my strengths? Like, what am I good at? Cause I don't know. And I'm thinking, well, you're good at a lot of things. But of course, I'm thinking also in the back of my head, well, you're good at arguing. <laughs> you're really good at being stubborn, right? So I'm thinking about all that, but how do I put that into a strength, right? So I'm thinking to myself, all right, you can debate, right? You're really good at negotiating. When you see a vision, you hold to it. Uh, you don't necessarily agree with naysayers. You don't let other people's opinions bring you down. Now, that's a challenge for a parent it's to know how to identify strengths in those people that we lead. So that is the point of this chapter is, is helping your team and helping yourself really find that strength zone. And, you know, and then book talks about how uh, if Tiger Woods had a bad game of golf, right? He goes back to the driving range and he starts practicing his swing again. He starts going through all the things all over again so that he can practice and get better. And from an outside perspective, you'd think, oh, he's working on his weaknesses, but Really, he's working on his weaknesses within his strength zone. He's not going to practice accounting or <laughs> practice basketball. He's not changing his sport, right? He's staying within his strength zone, but he's working on his weaknesses within that zone. That makes sense. So it's important as parents, but also as leaders to identify these strengths in our children or in our teammates and find out what they're doing well so that we can help encourage them to continue developing these areas that they will be great at. So searching for strengths, right? The first few years of leadership can be frustrating. Let's just put it that way, especially even before you really identify yourself as a leader or not. First few years, even just into adulthood can be confusing because you're like, not sure where you fit in, not sure what your strengths are. You're trying lots of different things. Um, if you're in a network marketing profession, you may be jumping around to a lot of different companies to try to figure out kind of where you fit in and what you think you're going to be good at. And it can be frustrating because inexperience can lead people to try lots of different things. You don't really know where you're, you're fitting in yet. And other people's expectations of our opinions are very high. So early in my career, you know, I did all kinds of things. Like I could, I think I've probably done every job you can think of. <laughs> okay, like literally, I, I've been in sales, I've been in um, customer service, I've, I've bagged groceries before, I've pushed carts from the, you know, the lot, and I've done everything. And, and early on in my career, I figured out a lot of what I didn't want to do. I found a lot of my non strengths. And I think that's helped me become a better leader, because I've got to kind of eliminate some things that I'm not really that great at. You know, the way Josh and I function, people say, oh, look, now Jen is the CEO. Oh, now Josh is the CEO. Now we're really just co-CEOs. Let's just put it that way. And the way we function is left brain, right brain, right? I tend to be more creative. I have a musical background. I can just pick up an instrument and start playing. Um, so I think about things a little bit differently. He's very analytical. He's very like data detail oriented. He's very tech. He has a chess brain. He has a mind for like a programmer. So he thinks completely differently than I do. So when we work together in our individual strength zones, we're not trying to compensate for each other's well, we are compensating for each other's weaknesses, but we're not trying to be in each other's lane, if that makes sense. Like, I would never want to take over all the math that's involved in the company. You guys would be very disappointed if I had done that. So I, I put him in his lane and he, and he puts me in my lane and that helps us work together in our strength zones. But again, 
first few years of our careers, we were still trying to figure out what these strengths were. And if you're new to network marketing or new to having success in network marketing, you may be trying to figure out, you know, what are my skills now and how can I translate this into my new career? When I was first starting out in network marketing, I knew what I could bring to the table in the industry. I knew I could do sales. I knew about marketing. There were a lot of weaknesses I did have for sure, especially on the communication side. I do know that I knew I could teach how to do sales. So that was one area that I focused on as a new network marketer that helped me rise uh, up through the ranks. Um, so here's the other deal is sometimes we end up in too big of a role too fast. Now, sometimes this can happen with our amazing comp plan where you rise through the ranks too quickly. And some of you are like, well, that would be really great if that happened to me. But sometimes you get into a situation where your role is bigger than you're, you're able to manage. So it's important to personally grow along the path of rank advancement and not to leave that part out because new levels bring new devils, as, as we've said before. Our roles and responsibilities require us to perform tasks that we don't, if we don't have the skills for, we're going to become ineffective leaders. If you've hit, uh, you know, 500k affiliate because you're really great in one area, but you can't maintain your rank because of the other areas you're weak in, and you're not sourcing leaders to fill the gaps there, you're going to have a hard time uh, being an effective leader. So it's important to develop these areas out and to source talent where it needs to be to sustain your team and the growth there. Okay, so one thing I want to say is patience is key. So we talked about this on our last call about patience, right? Um, and it's going to take patience to find your strengths and to recruit the people that are going to help you compensate. So how I'm going to put this in a network marketing scenario is our teams right now, they all kind of develop their own systems, which is a normal thing that would happen in any company. Sometimes a company has a system and everybody just follows that. That's something that we're working on actually, that we're putting together a system that's easy for people to duplicate and continue on. But if the company says something like that in place, it's up to develop systems. So I challenge you guys, if you have somebody on your team that is a particularly good presenter, let that person be the presenter. Now, I'm not saying you never have to work on your presentation game again. I'm just saying leverage the strength there, right? So if you have a Candice Bird Davis on your team, leverage her presentation skills. She's strong in that area. And then have somebody else on the team that may be really, really great at storytelling do the testimonial section of the presentation. Have somebody that's really, really great at numbers and compensation do that part of the presentation. Early in my daily choice, you guys, there is, I could not do an entire presentation. I will tell you guys right now, we had to split that thing up. Okay, Chris Robinson knows, Sonia knows, we had them all on the call when we did these calls and it was like, all right, Chris, you're the host. He's always the host because he's this funny guy. We could put him on. We don't have to give him any notice. We give him a mic, he runs with it and it comes out great. That's his strength zone. So we put him in that strength zone, right? And then we bring on Sonia maybe and she's going to share a little bit of how about how the sprays work. She's very strong in understanding product education. So we put her into that zone during the presentation, right? And then, so HempWorks comes up. Of course, everybody says Jenna's doing that. All right, I'll, I'll talk about HempWorks for sure. And then we get to the comp plan. All right, Josh, you do that. You're the numbers guy. So you're going to talk about that. It's not all on one leader. If you're creating a team environment, you're sourcing the strengths uh, in your leaders where you may be weak. I could, I probably still can't break down the comp plan. I could tell, I could tell you the, the main components. I know how to get paid in the comp plan. I can tell you how to do sales so that your back office has money coming through it. Uh, I can't necessarily break apart every little thing in it. That's where I'm going to say, Josh, <laughs> you know, or I'm going to point to somebody. I'm going to point to somebody else's strength and I'm going to leverage that to create a collaborative team environment, if that makes sense. So include your team to kind of share the portions that maybe you may be weak or maybe you may be strong in some areas. So let's shift the gears a little bit. Um, let's define personal success. So this is something that's kind of changed over the years, at least through my daily choice. I feel like at least for my own personal journey, this has definitely changed for me over time. You know, I, there was one point, even two years ago, I thought success was acquiring all the things that made you look successful. So I can definitely check that off my list, been there, done that. And guess what? That's not my version of success anymore. So 
my definition of per personal success has changed and it's going to be different for everybody that you encounter in this business, which is important to know how they view success so that you can play to their strengths so that they can get the results that they want. So I've embraced a lot of different versions for myself and I'm constantly redefining it even still to this day. So the important thing to know is true success is knowing your purpose in life for one, and growing to your maximum potential. Also, it's sowing seeds that benefit other people. So none of these are going to be possible unless you are working within your strengths. Now, knowing your purpose and your strengths are going to go hand in hand. You're not going to be given like amazing gifts in one area if and strengths in one area if you weren't meant to use that, right? So some of us maybe are weak at sales admittedly maybe we've always had a customer service job or maybe we've always been you know maybe we're in the medical profession or something that's completely maybe unrelated to sales and we just don't have the skills there but maybe we are a people connector we are we have a heart for people and we're able to make those connections um, so if that's your strength then that's something that you can work on within your team and knowing your purpose is going to help you kind of hone in on that so one thing, uh, one example used in the book I thought was hilarious is they talk about a neighborhood of boys that put a club together and they made the, they made the four-year-old the president of the club. And they said, well, why did you make the four-year-old the president? And they said, well, he couldn't be the treasurer. He doesn't know how to do math. You know, he couldn't be the secretary. He can't read or write. So we made him the president because he couldn't do anything else. Well, that's not really how leadership works. It's not just you're the guy in the top because you can't do anything else. Um, not leadership's not effective because of pity or by default, right? So good leaders must be intentional. We must be intentional. We must be strategic. The way I look at it is you're putting together your NFL roster, right? So when you're building your dream team, you have this kind of in the back of your head. People's purpose is not connected to their faults or their weaknesses, but it's rather connected to their potential. So I know that I know my my weaknesses as a leader so i'm going to leverage other people that are better in areas where i'm weak okay so one thing i want to say is when i was just now starting out in network marketing i had a mentor his name is daryl <laughs> some of you guys have heard this before some of you haven't but his name is daryl and he was 65 years old when i met him in fact the reason i met him is because i was selling him insurance and he happened to be a uh, in a network marketing company at the time. And so while I'm sitting here trying to sell him insurance, he's thinking in the back of his head, he's going to sell me his, his compensation plan or whatever his company is that he has, right? So he's slipping me his business card and I'm slipping him his business card. And he's 65 years old, so I'm selling him like Medicare insurance, right? And the reason I'm telling you that is because when all said and done, I got the policy sold. So I did get it. I, I got him sold, but he sold me at the same time because he saw strengths within me. So he's the talent scout, but I'm also just trying to make my money and make sure he's getting the policy needs. Well, the funny thing about it is I go on, I enroll as an affiliate in this particular company before MDC. And, and I'm calling people left and right. I'm doing my sales thing. I'm doing my my, where my strengths are and I'm signing people up one after the other hit my first rank within 24 hours and he's like mind boggled he's like how how did you do that he's like I've never seen anybody else do that you know other than I've been able to do that and he's showing me a book of all his success all his checks that he's made in an industry which is why I'm thinking if you can do it I can do it well he wanted me, we wasted so much time because he wanted me to teach him my way of doing things. Now, we talk about this a lot in the industry. We talk about follow the leader, do what they're doing. But what we fail to realize is not everybody can do it your way. Simplicity is what duplicates. I spent so much time trying to teach this man Facebook. He's 65 years old. He's never used Facebook before. It took him an hour to send one message in there. I had to teach him how to operate his cell phone. Like I spent so much time trying to get, okay, now go live. No, I could not teach him to do anything like that. He just, that wasn't his strength, but I can tell you something that he could do way better than me. And he had the checks to prove it. If we went out to a restaurant to eat, he could sign up four people just sitting there in the waiting room. 
Okay. He can, he could talk to anybody, anytime. He had absolutely no fear at all. Right. So he was a definitely a belly to belly kind of guy. He can make friends with the most craziest people and make them believe that they could succeed. That was something that I needed to work on. I may have had influence over my small group of friends. I didn't have the ability to just talk to anyone. I'm a shy person in real life. Like I didn't want to go talk to people in my in the grocery store. He, whereas he could talk to them <laughs> like nobody's business. So I spent so much time trying to teach him how I was doing it when really I should have just said, hey, like you're already crushing it. You're already doing it your way that's working. You're already taking the, the fundamental basics of this business and you're doing it in the avenue that makes sense for you. Why am I going to try to fix your weaknesses when you have strengths that we can be putting you into? So it's important when you're on, you when you're, when you're a leader of your team to know this about your people. If you're doing an all digital, all social media you know, system for people and there's people that are not following, they're going to have a really hard time rank advancing. So it's important to know your people. It's important to know the people on your team and know where they're going to be best fit. You know, and we have a lot of amazing leaders in our company right now, and they all are really good at their particular things they're good at. Like I said, Candice is a great speaker. She's a great motivator. If I am putting together an event agenda, I'm thinking of where am I putting all the leaders on stage, right? Uh, Robert is a great mentor. He has the ability to take one person and see t- see through to their success and so they're hitting the rank and they're they're at the vision where he and them have worked together alicia she's really great at communicating with people in local events she's not afraid to get out there alicia Pisino, she's part of the bni right so she does kind of groups like that and she's got creative ways to sell her products megan too dark at the top of my head i'm thinking this woman out hustles everybody i know and She's a self-motivator. I never have to call her and remind her to, to care about her business ever. It doesn't matter if the volume's up, volume's down. She's always got it in her mind that I can out-hustle my way anywhere, anytime. Nobody's going to stop me. I'm going to rise to the top. I don't have it figured out, but I'm going to figure it out. Like that's a strength and a, and, and a great quality for a leader. Does that mean she's great in all areas? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. Nobody is. But she's great in that area. Todd is a world-class industry trainer like it's and let me just tell you guys the difference here it's one thing to be really great at what you're doing it's another thing to be able to break it down into bite-sized pieces so other people can learn how to be great too so todd has a way of training the trainers i think that's a very important skill that is needed in the network marketing industry he created a whole business around that just because of that and just to put it in perspective like it's one thing for me to deliver a presentation but if i want to teach you how to deliver a presentation that's a whole nother set of skills that i'm going to have to teach you guys right so todd can get on stage and he can say this is how you do a presentation this is how you call your chicken list this is how you build a list this is how you you know put into production the things that he's particularly learned in the industry. Um, Antonina, I feel like she's a great visionary. She sees things before other people do. She has a unique way of leadership and she can rally people with her energy and her energy alone. I think that's something that should be said and focus on. Those are her strengths. So we all have strengths. We all have talent in this company. You all have talent in your team right now. It's our job as a talent scout, as an upline leader, to put these people to work where they are best working. And I will say that we're doing this right now on the corporate side as well. I'm getting to know everybody in the company, right? That may freak some people out. I understand that, but I wanna make sure everybody's being used in the right ways, right? I wanna make sure that if you're particularly talented here, then you should be focused here. If you're weak here, then I'm gonna take you out of here and put you over here. That's part of running a company. And that's something that I've been working on myself. And Josh as, as well. So like I said, you're never going to be called to do something you have no talent for, right? So if you're sitting here like, man, what are my talents? I don't think I have any. You do. I promise you do. There's something that you do differently than everybody else. People's purpose in life is always connected to their giftedness. It's just about being able to identify that. So if you want to grow to your maximum potential, you can't grow to your maximum potential if you're continually working outside of your strengths, right? So improvement has to be always related to your ability as it is right now. And the greater your natural ability, the greater your potential for improvement. 
if you only are focusing on your weaknesses, um, then you might reach mediocrity, but you're never going to get beyond that. So I will tell you guys, when I was in high school, I had straight A's, except for one class. So it wasn't really straight A's, was it? I got an F in math. I had to retake. I'm going to tell you guys, you guys probably think I'm dumb after this, but that's okay. I was a senior in high school and I shared the same class with my freshman sister. And the only reason I passed that class is because she helped me with my homework, math. Okay. I was in algebra, something basic geometry. I don't know. And it was just way not my thing. I wasn't interested in it. It was not my natural ability, not my gift. And what does school teach you guys? Well, you got an F here. So instead of saying, you know what, maybe math's not for you. We're going to put you over here where maybe you're really brilliant. Um, we're going to keep making you retake this class until you figure it out. So I had to take it twice. Okay. And to this day, I still don't, I still don't understand a lot of math and I still don't care to learn it either. Because why would I, if I can just call Josh and say, Hey, what is this? Or I can call somebody else that's a mathematician. The school system is all about uh, being mediocre in all areas. It has nothing to do with putting people in their strengths. Right. And if you get an F, well, you have to do it again. You get an F, you do it again. Or then you got to go to summer school and then you're going to focus more on your weaknesses until you're, you're blue and black in the face. Right. So for me, I, I couldn't understand, like, why was, where's the focus on the things that I'm good? Right. So if you want to live to mediocrity, good, be good at everything. But if you want to be better than mediocre, then focus on where you're great. That's the point. So and the next thing I want to add is living a life that benefits other people. This is another key factor to consider here. This is always going to be dependent on us giving our best, right? Not our worst. You can't give your worst and expect the best results. You have to always give your best. You must decide that you're going to be your best, wear your best. So it doesn't matter if you're, if you're great over here and you're bad over here. If you're always focusing over here, you're not going to be your best. So you always have to give your best, wear your best. Only your best is going to add value to others to help them do their best. And that is leadership. It's helping people develop those skills and, and, and to reach their full potential. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how to find your own strengths. There's a quote by Samuel Johnson, and he says, almost every man wastes part of his life and attempts to display quality which he does not possess. So if we think of the time we've wasted trying to identify uh, things that we are or aren't good at. We've all done this. We've all spent time in areas we probably shouldn't have spent time in. And, you know, there's been a survey done with over 2 million people, and it stated that only 20% of people are working within their strength zones into their, in their full potential, 20% of people. And I'm talking about in the job world right now. 20% of the job market, people are in the right roles. That's crazy. That's called ineffective leadership, okay? So, how do we get that number higher? Well, we have to pay attention, right? We got to know our people. We got to make sure we're paying attention to the people that are on our team that have special talents. So tips to discover and develop who you are and bring the strengths you have to your leadership. Ask yourself, what am I doing well? What skills and abilities do you have that are way beyond average? Okay, one particular skill Robert Hollis has is he... I don't know if he's a magician or what, but as soon as he stands on stage, everybody's energy shifts, right? Everybody has to laugh when Robert laughs. <laughs> it's like magic. That's a strength. That's something he can do that's way beyond average. I don't think I could duplicate that, honestly. Maybe some of us could, maybe some of us couldn't. But what are your skills and abilities that you do beyond average? Get specific. Number two is get specific about your strengths. We got to be very specific here. The more specific you can get about your strengths, the better chance you can find your sweet spot. So I know particularly what I can do is I can read a book. I can break it down into lessons. I can, I can translate it for people. That's a communication skill that I have now that I didn't always have. It's one of my strengths. I have ability to get on stage without notes and just run with it and deliver a sermon that people need to hear at the right time in the right place. That's one of my strengths. I'm in that zone I had the ability to do that. Uh, you guys have to identify what you have the ability to do and where you can get specific about your strengths to find your sweet spot that works for your business. Number three, 
listen for what other people are saying about you. Listen for other people's praise. You know, maybe you are doubt on, doubting yourself or you have little confidence in, in some areas. But if you hear what people are saying about you, they're continuously praising, hey, you're really good at this. Uh, you got to identify that. You got to examine that. And you have to start developing that. So like my son's like, I'm not good at anything. That's crazy to me that he would think that because this kid can sit here and in, I don't know, two minutes, he can solve a Rubik's cube. I can't do that. He's memorized all the algorithms. So he doesn't know what his strengths are. So I'm telling him what, what they are because I see them from a different perspective. So again, listen for what people are saying about you of where your strengths are. That's an indicator of where you may be good. And number four is this is going to maybe be a little shocking here, but check out the competition. And I'm not saying to become obsessed with finding out what everybody else is doing or comparing yourself to others, but rather ask yourself, how can you utilize your strengths to become a differentiator, right? What makes you different than the competition? How can I utilize my strengths in a way that enables me to do things better or differently than, than those around me? And what are the consequences if I do or don't utilize my strengths? So again, when I started my network marketing career, I knew what made me different. Sales. That was it. I knew that I could crush sales in any direction. Give me the product. I'll master it. I'll learn it. And I'll go take it to the world. I knew I could do that. That's what made me different. I also knew that I could teach. I have a lot of teachers in my, in my family, and I knew that I had the gift to teach. So if I could do sales and I could teach, I, could, I figured I could build a team. So without any network marketing experience at all, I took my experience from the outside world and brought it to here so that I could make myself different. I'm a lot, I'm a lot different than Robert Hollis. I'm different than Todd. I'm different. And why would people join them versus me? Why would somebody join a Lynn Cooper versus an Aaron Parker, right? What makes you different? Why should somebody join your team? And if honestly, if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know why anybody would join me. Well, then that's where we got to start, right? You have to know that because even though we have a one team here in my daily choice, we're still building our own paychecks, right? So it's important to know, you know, in, in not in just your sales pitch, but what makes you different. You have to know how you're going to fit in. You might not be better than other people, but you may be different. And that's a, a, an important thing to know. Self-aware leaders know and develop the strengths of their people. So here's the other part. Good leaders who are self-aware don't just help themselves. Okay, organizations, Francis Hesselbain says, organizations exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. So, to make the organizations exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. That's super powerful if you think about that. So, how can we help others develop their own strengths? Well, step one is you have to become secure in your own leadership. You got to know what makes you different. You got to know what makes you great. You got to know how you can help somebody else. Number two is you got to study and know the people on your own team. Number three, you got to communicate to individuals how they fit on the team. And even the newest person, give them a role, you know, say, hey, we're going to have a presentation this Thursday and uh, Candace is going to host it. Um, Chris Robinson is going to do the comp plan. Robert's going to do um, the, the vision and the whatever part of the slides he's going to do and you're brand new. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you invite 10 people that want to change their life. Okay. So you got to put people in action, right? Communicate to the individuals, how they fit on the team, communicate to all team members, how each player fits on the team, which is basically what I just said. This is part of leading, right? Hey, Robert, you take this, Chris, you take that, Candace, you take that, putting it all together. And then lastly, emphasize completing one another, Okay. So working in your team, it's important to complete each other and not compete <laughs> with each other because that's not going to work either. We have to we have to get along and we have to make it work. And this is why I don't understand why in this industry there's ever team drama. I think the only reason there's ever team drama is there's just lack of self-aware leaders. And that is it. So here's my questions for you guys for reflection. I want you to ask yourself these questions as we hop off of this call, okay? Ask yourself this. 
Where are you strongest? What are my top three strengths? Where am I weakest? And who on my team, team can I use? Who can, oh, sorry, who on my team can I help using my strengths? And then lastly, who can I ask to help me where I'm weakest? So the last goal we talked about accountability and accountability isn't just necessarily showing up it, or having somebody to make you show up, right? It's, it's also having somebody call you out. And so, and, and not all of us, our egos like to be involved with that. Not all of us want to be called out where we're weak, but you have to know where you're weak so that you can source talent to fulfill that and, and also work towards that if it's in your strength zone. So here's some action steps. You got to put your team together like you're building an NFL roster. Okay, because honestly, with 2.0 coming, you guys, it's go time. So you better have your teams in place. If you started a brand new business, a network marketing business tomorrow, and you had to relaunch all over again, who are your top 10 people you're going to put in action? You got to put your top 10 people in action and you got to delegate wh where their strengths are. Who plays what part and who goes where <laughs> and who does what? And you got to interview these leaders to establish these zones, the strength and weaknesses zones. So like I said, in MDC, it's a little bit of a different culture here, right? So um, it is kind of a one team, one dream feel. And I think that's something that separates us and differentiates us from other companies out there that are very much team isolated. We kind of bring everybody together. And I think that's super important um, when, you're, when you're building your team environment and when you're locating strengths within the team. So... This is, this is what is going to conclude our training today, you guys. Thank you so much for hopping on here. Hope you got some notes, and I will see you guys next Wednesday on our next call. All right, guys. We'll see you. Recording.